We start a new series today, and so it's going to be, uh, I think, uh, fun. It's one that I will enjoy, I know, because this is, uh, for a few weeks, you're going to allow me to go back to my philosophy major roots and stuff that's just fun to dig into and read and study and process. And in the midst of that uh, philosophy, one of the most powerful statements of the human condition I know is one that I heard as a young boy. Uh, how many of you know who Popeye the Sailor Man is? He was not the most educated or sophisticated guy. He had a girlfriend named Olive Oil. Not really cover girl worthy. Had a friend named Wimpy. Always ready to pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. And he was always being harassed. His nemesis, Brutus, always there harassing him. Popeye faced disappointments in life when he was disappointed, frustrated, and life just wasn't going. It felt like he wasn't up to a challenge. He had a saying to describe his condition. I am what I am, and that's, and that's all what I am. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. He was just a simple sailor man. And just looking at him, there wasn't much reason to get your hopes up that he was going to be the hero of the story. In many ways, Papa, I think, portrays the human condition. I am what I am. And that's all what I am. I'm grateful to get to exist, to have a life. Uh, but I'm not, I know I'm not all that I'm meant to be. Uh, there is a brokenness. I am what I am. And it stands in stark contrast to what God tells us in Scripture about how he is in the transformation business. Uh, for example, there was a man named Moses. He's walking in the wilderness one day when he sees a burning bush that doesn't burn up. And there is a voice that spoke from the bush. Uh, in my paraphrase, Moses, I've seen the misery of my people. I've come to rescue them. And I want to use you to do that. I want you to lead my people. Go to Pharaoh. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to demand of him that he let my people go so you can lead them out of slavery into freedom. Now, if you know this story, you remember how Moses responded with a string of objections about why he could never be or do what God wanted. Do you ever feel like that? He reminds God, who am I to do this? I'm a fugitive. I killed a man. I'm wanted. I'm in exile. I'm just a lowly shepherd from the backside of nowhere. I don't have a lot of abilities. I talk kind of slow. Now, don't get me wrong, God. I appreciate this opportunity, but I am what I am. And God says, it's not in Scripture this way, but God says, I know all about you and your inadequacies and your weaknesses. It doesn't matter. This, this is the part that's not in Scripture. You am what you am, but you am not what you am going to be. <laughs> Moses, I will be with you. It will be the two of us. You and I will do this together. Now, Moses wasn't convinced about that. He, you, you know, he had another objection. Uh, it reads this way. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I am the God who wants to be known. I am the God who heard when no one thought I was listening. I am the God who has seen the misery of my people when no one thought I was looking. I am the God, Moses, who knew you when you were a baby in a basket hidden among the reeds. 
I am the God, Moses, who knows you as a fugitive in the desert. I am God. I am the God who comes to you. So get your hopes up because I am who I am. We know, if we've been a Christian for long, that this is the great name of God. Regarded as so holy by the people that no one would say his name. All we have are the Hebrew letters that we say, Yahweh. It's actually an unpronounceable word. And to this day, while we have our English transliteration, we're not exactly sure how it should be pronounced in Hebrew. Whenever they wrote the name, they would make sure they had a fresh pen to be able to use. And because the name was considered so sacred, some scribes even bathed themselves before they would write it down. This God, I am who I am. This self-sufficient, self-sustaining, all-powerful, infinitely creative, redemptive God begins to lead God, Moses and his people in a new experience of transformational living. God gives them the Torah so they can know how to follow God and what to do. And there had never been anything like this. They were given the revelation that the world is not left to itself. Life isn't made up of a a bunch of little tribal gods that they had who were always getting into turf wars with each other. God shows them that there is a great creator, one who is author of all that is good and all that is right in life. That's another idea that had never existed before. It was given to the people of Israel and it changed history. They were given a way to worship that involved the tabernacle that was inhabited by the presence of God where he came to dwell, that Shekinah glory, and the people could gather there in awe and wonder. Later, there was the temple where the people would come to sacrifice. They were given the prophets. They were given the prophets who stood as the conscience of the people about how life should be lived and how the poor and the homeless could be helped. And there had never been people like the prophets before. So beginning with Moses, God gives all of this to them. But things were still pretty messed up. The kingdom hadn't come yet, and things were not right on earth. Then one day in the fullness of time, there came a man who began teaching about a new kind of life. Life with God in his kingdom, living under his rule, experiencing his presence in their lives, enjoying his favor, strengthened by power. He taught that this life is possible for all people, men, women, free, slave, rich, poor, Jew, Gentile. His name was Jesus. He said he was the kingdom bringer. All the hopes of humanity wrapped up in him. He is the culmination of redemptive history. Listen to what he said one day to the people. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The crowd was staggered by this. Their amazement is heard in their reply. You aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? And their question leads to one of the most dramatic statements in all of history. I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. He already existed when Abraham entered history. Look again at how he says it. Before Abraham was even born, I am. They knew that he was claiming that God had come down to earth in him. There in that epistle, John tells how the people picked up stones. They understood he was claiming to be God, and they were ready to kill him for that. Eventually, they would do that on a cross. There was, however, a group of people, it was small at first, who were convinced that he was redefining what was possible in human life because of his life, of his teachings, of his death, his resurrection, the empty tomb. Uh, 
They believe that he is the kingdom bringer, that he can bring up there, down here, that Jesus is it. Everything people were hoping for. And so they wrote in their letters to one another and their records of his life, which became the New Testament scriptures, their descriptions, the promises of what life can look like for people who follow Jesus. And what they wrote, it's extraordinary. But listen, people, the extraordinary in God's power, it is possible. For instance, Jesus is quoted as saying, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And I am. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. The Greek word actually says that streams of water will flow from the belly. I like that picture. Life flows from deep within. There is an overflow of that reservoir of life that Jesus places within us. Jesus also says in another place, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. A full, rich life, not paupers. And Jesus also says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Jesus offers peace with no conditions, meaning that no one can take it away from us. This is a concept that also staggered his followers about what Jesus could be as he takes up residence. Paul, for example, he wrote of this. He said, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Think about it. Christ in you. Never before had that been possible. It was always God out there. Now it's God in here. You turn to almost any book in the New Testament, you'll see this picture of this amazing life. Peter writes about it in in his letter. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, You trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. I I, I love the way that last phrase goes together. You rejoice. It's glorious, but it's an inexpressible joy that we're trying our best to be able to express and realizing that we'll never quite get there, but yet we trust him, and that comes flowing out as we praise him and we rejoice in his name. Peter writes this to real people, and he says this of the people to whom he writes. He says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Let that love flow. And in doing this, Peter says that they can actually see this take place. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Rid yourselves of all of that. How many of you would say that this pretty much describes you? That it's all gone. That it's all wiped out. That you are filled with inexpressible joy. That you're pretty much free of malice and deceit and hypocrisy, envy, slander. Uh, People around you notice that your belly is flowing with rivers of living water. It's all available and it's possible in Jesus. And you are exhibit number one of the transformed life that Jesus describes as he works with his disciples. My question is this. Why doesn't this seem to be the norm for God's people? Why not? And here is what I think often happens to us. I think a lot of us, we hear the gospel and we are overwhelmed by this man, Jesus, and the vision of life he offers and everything that he's done for us. And we respond to him and we say, yes, absolutely, that's what I want. 
Then there's this kind of honeymoon period. And many of you know what that's like. You're, you're drawn to Scripture. You can't get enough of Scripture at that point. You find you have to tell people about Jesus. Oh, you love to worship. And, and many things change in your life. Uh, maybe some crude language is cleaned up. Maybe some addictions are overcome. You have places where you serve gladly. And eventually this process of transformation, it just seems to stall. And there's this gap that we have to deal with. Instead of my life looking like the amazing picture that's painted in the New Testament, it looks more like this. I yell at my children. I worry about my job or money. I become jealous of people who are more attractive or more successful or who have just have more. I use deception to get out of trouble. I pass judgment on people, and I'm stuck there in that gap because, you know, I am what I am, and that's all what I am. This goes on for a while, and I read about putting off the old nature and how if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. But instead of feeling inspired by these words, they begin to sound intimidating because I know it's not taking place that way in my life. And so I'm confused. I I can become discouraged and tired because I find myself stuck in the gap between what is promised and the realities of my life where it seems like I'm always falling far short of being filled with inexpressible joy as found in a full and abundant life. And so I deal with the gap the gap between the promise and the reality of where I find my life to be. And many of us as Christians, we find ourselves stuck in this gap and we end up, we end up devising strategies to be able to manage the gap. So here at the start of this new series, let's talk about the gap for a couple of minutes. Many people look at this gap and they think, and this is in your outline, this next information, it won't be on the screen, Many people look at this and they think, I've got to try harder to be a better Christian. I'm just not putting enough effort into it. And so we try to bridge the gap by trying hard to be a better Christian. We live in an age where overachievement is celebrated. It's rewarded. You get get the promotion. And if it works in other parts of my life to pay the price and try harder, I just need to give the same kind of spiritual super effort. I'll get up earlier, I'll pray longer. I'll read more books, listen to more podcasts. I'll work harder to be nicer. And so you hear about someone, they tell how they get up at 4 a.m. every day to pray. And you feel guilty. So you resolve, I'll do the same thing. You're not a morning person. At 4 a.m., you're groggy, you're grumpy. No one wants to be around you at 4 a.m., not even Jesus But you think, you know, this is really hard. It's exhausting. It's miserable. It has to be spiritual because it's so miserable. Jesus has to be in this. And so you make it for a day or two. And then you stop and you feel guilty. You try other things, cycles of effort, followed by exhaustion, followed by giving up, followed by guilt. Repeated cycles are exhausting, not just to your body, but to your soul. Now you know that you are included in those to whom Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. But if you're stuck in the gap, even those words are going to sound confusing because Jesus and the spiritual life feel like they are wearing you out. The answer is not just found in trying harder. Others, realizing that, try to bridge the gap by pretending to be a better Christian. I can handle it by pretending. I see what other people are doing, so I'm just going to fake it till I make it. Uh, That's the way I'll go at it. Uh, Life, and so in that, life is a miracle a minute. Uh, These kind of people, they smile a lot, even when things are going really rotten. Every prayer, every prayer that they ever pray, it's answered. Every decision is a word that God has given directly to them, and every sentence ends with praise the Lord. But when everything is quiet and they're alone, the gap is still there. 
Others will try to bridge the gap by rededicating themselves. Happened often while I was growing up in youth group. You know how the last night at camp, someone would tell a heart-rending story, very emotional. It might even include a story about a group of teenagers who were driving home. They had a crash, and they died. And even better, they were driving home from camp where they had failed to make that decision before they left camp and to rededicate themselves. And so you never know when that crash is going to happen. And so if you really need to rededicate, why don't you come? Because rededication will answer it all. But the problem is we get home and that rededication, it wears off. Others try to bridge the gap by switching spiritual venues. Handle the gap by switching venues and styles. You know, maybe those charismatic people know something I don't know and it's something I should try. Or maybe I need to go to that church that has really deep theology. Or maybe the liturgy and the sacraments, maybe that's the way to go. Uh, Maybe I should be in a place where the poor and disadvantaged are helped. If I go to another kind of church where they've got it, maybe that will take care of the gap that I feel. It's a pretty common thing for people to try that. Another way... The hardest way is we quit trying to bridge the gap and we just kind of give up. Just give up. It's just too much. Uh, This different kind of life, that's for all those other people. It's not for me. Now, they stay a Christian. In most cases, they keep going to church. They even join in with the activities. They figure they're going to go to heaven someday when they die. But the gap between the realities of life and what Jesus has has promised, and what they read in the Bible, it just seems to be too much, so they just secretly give up figuring it was not meant for them. So here is my question for this series, as we're going to have some fun tracing streams of life throughout the history of the church and the primary ways in which those streams of life flow. What if, what if Jesus really knew what he was talking about? What if there really is another way? What if you really can become increasingly alive with love and joy and peace and all of the other fruit of the Spirit? What if Jesus is right and it's possible and it doesn't happen by trying harder? I'm going to read a few more verses that speak about this reality because there really is someone at work to bring about this kind of life in you. Yes, in you. He wants you to know that it's not primarily up to you. Paul, for example, wrote in Philippians 1, I am certain that God, who began the good work, God does that work, that he will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. God is going to be about that work in your life. A little later in that same letter, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That often bothers people. But we we join in. Why do we join in? For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose in your life. He's always about being able to let that, make that happen. We need to let it happen. And when Jesus starts to call his followers, his first followers here on earth, what was his invitation to them? He said, come, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus took common men, common people, fishermen. They were fishing. They were fishing because they had failed to make progress to the next level level in the rabbi school that was attended by all young men. They had learned that they had reached their ceiling. They didn't have what it took to become a specific rabbi's disciple. They had gone unchosen. They had learned the hard lesson, I am what I am, and what I am, it's not good enough. Jesus comes along and he calls them to follow because he knows you am not yet what you am going to be. And so he calls them to come and follow. Those of you who know about Popeye are very aware that he knew about his shortfalls. But he had a secret. He was an ordinary sailor. 
but he was sometimes given power. Now, now Judy saw this on Facebook the other day, the Canadian version of, uh, of uh, Family Feud. And the question uh, being asked was, what was Popeye's favorite food? Chicken! <laughs> well, we know they were thinking about the real Popeye. It's spinach. 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 I used to eat spinach because of Popeye. Grown-ups would tell us, eat spinach, it will put hair on your chest. I didn't know if I wanted hair on my chest or not. <laughs> but, but they made it sound good, so I ate spinach. And then one day we were eating fresh spinach when a big green worm came crawling out of the spinach on my grandpa's plate. That was gross. But I still ate spinach. Because everyone, everyone wants power from outside to help us because you know what? I am what I am. And I know I need help. Jesus tells us he will make you what you are not yet, but what you could be. He will make you what you were made to be. And so what if, what if Jesus is really present all the time? What if through his spirit, Jesus not only came to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven and go to heaven, but also to make his presence alive in us? his power available to us? What if he came to transform our lives as scripture tells us? The best news I can give you while it's still early here in 2020 is that it's not your task to change or to transform yourself. Hear that again. It is not your task to change or transform yourself. It's not about trying harder. I was working this last week with some of this where we try to change our own norms and why it doesn't work as I've been working ahead. Here's the secret. Because he is in us, what we need to do is stay connected to him so that the streams of living water can flow as God promises that they will. Uh, Dallas Willard writes that authentic transformation is possible when... We arrange our lives around those practices that Jesus arranged his life around so that we will continually be receiving life and love from the Father. Growth and transformation are much more about what we experience in Christ than what we know about Christ. Now, we need to know about Christ, but it's much more about what we experience in Christ, of Christ in us. And so the passage that John used last week, it fits here so well at the beginning of 2020. Therefore, Paul said, I urge you in view of God's mercy, offer. The one thing we need to do is to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind as you offer yourself to God. I'm going to sum up the spiritual lesson for this morning this way. Spiritual growth and development, or a changed life, is the result of believing with our whole bodies that what Jesus said is true. That's it. Believe Jesus and let him do his work. Now, I've added a little bit of an introduction for you of what's going to follow over the next few weeks, a summary of the essential practices as found in the six great traditions that are in the history of Christian faith. And you're going to likely find some of these more meaningful to you than others. And that's all right, because they are all found in Jesus. It's just at different periods in church history, at different times, different of these uh, trends, these streams that flow have been predominant. And so those different streams where we have the contemplative stream, that's the prayer-filled life. And there have been different uh, figures throughout church history where they have championed that. There is the holiness tradition, uh, the tradition in which I grew up discovering the virtuous life. 
There is the charismatic tradition, discovering the spirit-empowered life. All of these are streams throughout church history. The social justice tradition, the compassionate life, as the poor and the disadvantaged are, are helped. There is the evangelical tradition that focuses, it centers around the word of God. It is the word-centered life. And then there is the incarnational tradition or the sacramental life where the sacraments take center stage. What I'm excited about is this. Jesus wants to transform us. Throughout history, he's done that in people's lives in different ways. And so these opening weeks of this new decade, we're going to be about entering into Jesus' way so that we can start really living the Jesus kind of life. And so this morning, I'm going to wrap this up with a theme verse that comes from the pen of Paul that I also use for those of you who were here for the funeral on Thursday to kind of wrap up the life of Vern Hansen. It's the Popeye verse. But by God's grace, Paul wrote, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any of them. Yet not I, but God's grace that was in me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you make some astounding statements in Scripture of how your life will take up residence in us. And not only take up residence in us, it will flow through us to change people in the world around us as you use us in that incredible way. I know there have been different periods in my life where I have found myself stuck in that gap. That frustrating gap. Where all I really needed to do was to turn back to you and ask you to flow, to flow as you've promised to flow and to let your life be that which is evident and to continue that process of just transforming my life. God, I am what I am, but I offer all of that to you. I offer it to you freely, as completely as I can. And friend, if you're able to say and make that your prayer, simply to tell the Spirit of God, I am what I am. But I offer all of that to you, God. Because you know what you want me to be. Do that work in my life. And so, Jesus, with all those resolutions, where we, we make those resolutions with that determination that we are going to change who we are, the way we are, what we are, what we do. Our prayer of surrender this morning is, do your work. Do your transforming work in and through me so that streams of living water will flow with abundance because we know a living God. And so we give ourselves to this pursuit over the next few weeks, trusting that you will do your work of transformation in our lives. And may it ever be for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.